Hey, we have a great program for you today and it's gonna be very interesting and very timely. First of all, we have with us Dr. Wayne Grudem, who's professor of theology at Phoenix Seminary. He is a man who holds several degrees, but yet he brings things down to a very simple understanding for the rest of us, if I might add. Uh, he has his doctorates from the University of Cambridge in England, from Harvard University, and from Westminster Seminary of Theology. And then we also have with us Dinesh D'Souza, who is president of King's College uh, in New York. And uh, you might recognize Dinesh D'Souza's name by the smash hit documentary entitled 2016, Obama's America. Uh, both these men are tremendous thinkers. We're gonna gather around the table together and uh, we're gonna look at and talk about some of the issues that I think are important to you, certainly important to the Christian today. And so um, I hope that you get a lot out of this. So uh, join us and um, maybe out of all of this, uh, your worldview may become a biblical worldview. Dr. Wayne Grudem, Dinesh D'Souza, I have some time sensitive questions to ask you. We are coming up on an election. And as we sit here, we're just a few weeks out. And what I want to ask you, Dr. Grudem, I'll talk and ask of, of this, uh, this first from you. Um, why would, why should a Christian get involved in this vote when um, they may not agree with the policies of Barack Obama, but they're not very excited either about voting for a Mormon. And so what, what's, what's the answer to that? Right. Well, Jack, the first thing I say is that I already voted for a Mormon back in 2002. Right. We had uh, a conservative Mormon running against a liberal candidate. The liberal candidate, unfortunately, won. Her name was Janet Napolitano. Now, Secretary of Health and Human yes. or Secretary of Homeland Security. Right. Um, my wife and I voted for the Mormon candidate, Matt Salmon, because he had much more conservative values. When Janet Napolitano was elected, she proceeded to veto one pro life, one pro family bill after another, after another, numerous ones. When the conservative legislature tried to pass bills, she would veto, 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 veto. We would have been much better off with a uh, Mormon governor. Now, I look back in the Bible and I find that. Um, not just for the nation of Israel, but in secular nations, God seemed to use people of all different religious backgrounds to care for his people, like the Pharaoh in Egypt who gave the Jewish people good land to live in in Egypt, or Cyrus, king of Persia, who sent the Jewish people mm. back home from their homeland, uh, from, from, uh, back home from exile to their homeland, That's great. or the Roman Empire that gave Paul the freedom to travel throughout the Roman Empire and gave him the pr protection of its laws. So, um, and in American history, God has used, uh, like Benjamin Franklin, who wasn't a born-again right. Christian, uh, but did great good for the country. So uh, my answer is we're voting for a president, not a pastor. And uh, <laughs> yes, I think surely if a, if a Mormon has uh, views on moral and political issues that are consistent with the Bible, then go ahead and vote for that person. So can I press this a little bit further? This may sound very controversial. And, and then Dinesh, I'd love to hear what you have to think about this. A lot of people today will say, well, I can't do that. I heard you, I heard you Wayne, I can't do it. Because I have, uh, I, 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 I want to vote my conscience and I don't have that opportunity in this election. And, and I'm hearing that conscience almost supersedes a biblical worldview. What can you say to that? Well, does your conscience tell you you should vote for the protection of human life, such as the life of the unborn? Does your conscience tell you you should vote for the protection of marriage, protection of religious freedom, protection of rule of law in the mm. nation, protection of a strong defense, protection of strong education of children and, and, and parental authority over children's education? Um, what does it say about protection of Israel and, and defending Israel rather than snubbing its leaders? I, I think on conscious issues, one after another, and especially... Now, in this downturn of our economy, about mm. care for the poor and care for those who are out of work. Right. If we care about those issues, then I think we should vote. Sure, vote your conscience if your conscience tells you to protect life, marriage, jobs, <laughs> <laughs> the nation. If you have a biblical worldview sure. conscience. religious huh? freedom. Sure. Uh, if your conscience, no, the Bible talks about people's conscience sometimes misleading That's them. Right. Romans 2 uh, talks about somebody's conscience accusing or perhaps excusing Excuse him. Right. 
And uh, so I would say uh, what I've heard you say, Pastor Jack, and that is the standards of the Bible have to rule over your conscience, not your conscience ruling over the standards of the Bible. I think people are accountable to God for oh, how amen. they vote. I, if I could just mention, I just, I just saw this uh, two days ago in my Bible, Psalm 82, and I wrote vote in the margin. It says it's God talking to human rulers. But you see, if we, um, if we vote in a nation, have the right to vote, we partly rule. That's right. And so how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? How long will you vote unjustly and right. give your votes to the wicked? Oh, that's good. Okay, give justice to the weak and fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute. God's saying that to human rulers, and we're part of that if we vote. Rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked, vote right. And I think if Christians don't vote for those moral principles and those moral good things, they're not lesser of two evils, those are good principles. If Christians don't vote, they're, being, they're disobeying the responsibility Amen. that God has given them to have part rule in the nation. When are you going to get passionate about this issue? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Right. I love it. I mean, I, you know, add a small thought to that. It's hard to improve on what Wayne said, yeah. but the, I think what the founders were trying to get at here is that they believed it was the domain of the church to focus on theology and the domain of politics to focus on morality. Mm. And we often think of the two as identical. And to some degree, morality can come out of theology. But morality also comes straight out of conscience. In other words, I sometimes say, for example, when I read the Ten Commandments, it wasn't that I discovered a new truth in there. It wasn't like, you know, uh, cheating on your wife is wrong. Incredible! Whoa! You know, who knew? <laughs> you know, uh, it's that you already know. Don't steal. You know, and so you recognize in the Ten Commandments the codification of the things that you already know. Yeah. Um, so the point being here that, you know, you can have a guy who has a, a completely messed up theology yeah. and you might not let that guy preach in your, in your, in your, from your pulpit. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, if he's sound on economics, if he's sound on foreign policy, will defend the country, is sound on the moral issues, that's what he's, going, he's campaigning to be president to do. Sure. I said something recently, um, and it raises eyebrows every time I say it, and I, I don't even know why I'm saying it to you guys right now, to We're maybe raise to your hear. eyebrows. Yeah. Right. But... Um, it really comes from this. I, I heard people say before, well, you know, um, I'm a white guy. My family really put down the black people. And so I'm going to vote for, a, for Barack Obama because he's black. And when I heard that, I thought for a moment, wow, if I vote for Mitt Romney because he's white, then I'm a racist. Mm -hmm. If I vote for Barack Obama because he's black, irregardless of my color, if that's my reason, then I'm a racist. And very quickly, this gets very um, heated or emotional because, um, again, we're having our feelings drive this, this important vote. Or we're saying, well, golly, you know, I grew up in this kind of a home and maybe it's time for some penance to be employed in this vote. And... I've talked to a lot of people like this, and I got to tell you, it, it really concerns me how people think, where I would hope that we would have progressed onward to the point where, as an educated culture of people, have, have we not figured out by now? It doesn't matter what color you are. It's that content of your character. It's what you stand for. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about America when it begins to think like, well, I'm going to do this because... Right. So I have a little different take on this, uh, and that is that it, it, fundamentally this is not about who's a racist, because the same people who say I'm doing this for penance would not have voted for Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson ran for president. Uh, Al Sharpton ran for yeah. president. They didn't do very well. So what's the difference between Obama and those guys? That's a it's, great it, point. You know, it's not that Obama is an African American. I think the key to understanding Obama is he's a different kind of African American. He's not like Jesse Jackson. He's not like Al Sharpton. Mm. And that's the best thing going for him. Just that's like true. the best thing going for Mitt Romney. And if I were Mitt, I'd put it on his resume. I'm not Barack Obama. That's kind of, his, <laughs> that's kind of the source of his appeal, right? But back, you know, back to Obama, what, I think what Obama's doing is he's doing in politics what Oprah Winfrey does for people on TV. Oprah Winfrey had a massive following, yes. white women. Why? Because Oprah Winfrey was the one black woman in America who's, who made a secret pact with her audience, which was, I 
will never point my finger at you and call you a racist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume you are a morally good person. Yes. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yes. So I'm going to give you, to put it bluntly, the racial absolution certificate. You yes. don't have to do penance. I'm giving you the, the freedom yes. certificate right sure. now. Obama is the equivalent of that in politics. He's offering white America a racial absolution certificate. So it's not that people are doing any penance. No Obama voter I know does any penance. They're actually morally congratulating themselves. So Chris uh, Matthews, is the reason oh, yeah. he's so uncritical of Obama is it's not about Obama. He's basically saying, oh, I, Chris Matthews, I'm such a morally elevated and spectacular person that I'm supporting this guy. So it, it allows Chris Matthews to feel good about himself. himself. So it's a form of hubris. It's a form of self-pride and patting yourself on the back. But it is Obama's secret weapon. Now, it was stronger, I believe, in 2008 than it is this year. But it still is a force. That's powerful. That's powerful. So Christians voting this election, I think the data, I believe it comes, it comes from uh, the last vote. The analysis was there's something like 20 to 25 million registered Christian voters, as far as they can tell from what I heard in 08, and less than 10 million of them voted. They decided to stay home. This coming election, what would you say, what would you say, Dinesh, to, um, and I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I'm approaching this wrong, but as a pastor, what would you say to America's pastors about encouraging their people to get involved in the process? Why should they? Why should they do this? Um, I'm not a pastor, but I mean, if it were me, I would basically say that, you know, that if Christians don't exercise their moral duty to vote, they should be horsewhipped. Um, because uh, fantastic, <laughs> try that, Jack. Next, next Sunday morning, try, try saying that. See what happens. Because, In Jesus' name. <laughs> because here's why. I mean, you know, when I when I was in college, we had a professor, and he gave us a beautiful analogy of the lion tamer and the lion. Mm. And he said that if you go to the circus, you see the lion jumping up and down. The lion tamer has a little wand, and he makes the lion. He, and, and and the professor said, who's more powerful, the lion or the lion tamer? It's the lion. But the lion doesn't know that. The lion thinks that the lion tamer controls the show. Christians are like the lion. Oh There's goodness. enormous power in mm. Christian America if Christians would exercise it. So when I see all these Christians, I mean, and I see it all over the place. Oh, Dinesh, we don't really want to have a debate. Let's have a dialogue. Uh, you know, Christian, a and I just luck. say, well, Christian, you know, uh, isn't a debate a dialogue where your side wins? You know, <laughs> so, so there's a sort of a, you know, I, uh, they're so fastidious. They want to find someone who has uh, just the identical worldview that they have. Yeah. They look, politics is about the lesser evil. Yeah. Uh, and look, in World War II, we allied with Stalin, a bad guy. That's right. Because another bad guy, Hitler, posed a greater threat. better than Hitler. Uh, that is the real world. You sometimes ally with the bad guy to get rid of the worst guy. Um, and so um, right. that, to me, is not compromise. That is achieving as much good in the world as it is practically possible to achieve. Mm -hmm. And if you're so morally pu pure that you're not willing to play that game, your side will always lose. So what is, is this the old saying that you could become so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? Kind of. That would be um, kind of scary. Yeah. My point is that if, if Christians are active in the world and, and exercise their influence, the world will move a little bit more in the Christian direction. And if Christians abstain from the world, the world will pull more strongly in the but opposite direction. the world direction. would say but, to you, Dinesh, why don't you just keep your Christianity in the four walls of your church? We're not invading your church. Just, can't you just worship God there and not out on the main street? That's... Right. Now, so think of how, think of what sense that makes. I mean, in a, in a sense, even Christians, many of us have succumbed to a complete con. Well, what's the mm. con? Okay. We have a society uh, and we live in private at home and go to church, but we also have a public square. Let's call it this table right here. And so the, the secular guy goes, listen, uh, we have believers and unbelievers in this public square, but to be fair, let's take all the believers and ask them to leave. <laughs> let's, let's ex excommunicate them from the public square. But well, what happens? That turns the entire public square over to the unbelievers. Sure. Well, how is that just? I mean, in other words, if you, if you, if you want to be fair to, in a society, you'd say, well, listen, you've got believers, you've got unbelievers, you've got Catholics, you've got Protestants, you've got Jews, you've got Muslims. What is a way to figure out how all these different groups can coexist, express their views? So the very idea that you can pick one group and, and essentially make it into second-class citizens by saying, because mm. a secular person can, can vote for or against abortion for any reason. 
Whereas if a Christian is voting against abortion because it says it's wrong in the Bible or in the Christian yeah. tradition, somehow that argument is disqualified. Why? And does anybody uh, consult secular believers? Why are you voting for higher taxes? Why are you voting for... Nobody asks you. You just vote because that's the way you feel and that's the country you want. And Christians should be in the same position. Who cares if I'm against abortion because of the Bible, because of my conscience, because I think it's impractical? I could vote... For for any reason, uh, and, and, and if I'm going to be on a par with the secular voter, I should have the same rights. Very good. You know, I think, Jack, I certainly agree with what Dinesh is saying. What Christians, I think, should be doing in the public square is attempting to persuade. Nobody's mm. saying Christians should try to force their Christianity on anyone else. We believe that genuine faith cannot be forced. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. Parents can't force their children to become Christians. They can bring them to church. They can teach them the Bible. But the decision to believe in Jesus Christ as their personal That's Savior, right. they have to make that themselves. And if parents can't even force their children to become Christians, then surely it's futile to think the government that could ever force anybody to be a Christian. We want no part of that. We don't want to compel anyone to follow the Christian faith. That's right. But what we want to do is, as Dinesh says, in the marketplace of ideas, we want to allow our, our arguments and our reasons to have a voice and uh, to try to persuade and to say, isn't it good to have laws that protect against stealing, protect against lying and violating contracts, laws against murder? Well, mm -hmm. these are moral convictions that I have. They come from the Bible. But aren't they good for society in general? And I believe, as a, as a New Testament PhD, I believe that Romans 2 says mm -hmm. that every human being has the law, the work of the law written on mm -hmm. their hearts. Uh, and so their conscience bears witness, and it is a rough approximation of the moral standards of God. If Christians withdraw from the public square and do not have influence on a nation, well, that's what happened in Hitler's Germany. That's right. Where Christians were silent. When, and then it was too late. And, uh, it, but in the United States, in the le period leading up to the Civil War, the opposite happened. Two-thirds of the abolitionists in the United States in the 1830s were Christian pastors That's preaching right. politics from the pulpit saying that slavery was immoral, it was wrong, and the laws had to be changed. Amen. Now, that's Christians exercising a pers persuasive influence in the public square. If Christians had backed out of that, maybe we would have still had slavery today. Right. Who knows? And the same in England with Wilberforce. Wilberforce. He took that campaign. But um, I think that's what we need to do. We need to appeal to the good judgment of people. If we withdraw Christian influence and Christian voting mm. from the general public influence, all of a sudden that leaves the, the Bible silent. This is how we find out God's will for the all nations. It's how we find out God's will for all human races. But if you take this away, then mankind wanders in darkness, That's right. moral and spiritual darkness forever. We don't want to do that. Powerful. I think um, there's one difference between, let's say, the civil rights era, I mean, and the, the Civil War era now, and that is in the Civil War era, both sides, mm -hmm. and in fact, the whole country accepted the moral authority of the Bible. That's right. So uh, that's but one had a wrong view of what it they did. slavery, and they lost yeah. the argument. Right. But yeah. nevertheless, theologians in the North and South yes. could both refer to the Bible, and there was a common language. I think yeah. what's interesting now mm -hmm. is we're living to a large degree in secular culture. And so when it comes to an issue, let's take gay marriage. Mm -hmm. You are perfectly all right in saying that I derive my position on homosexuality 100% from Scripture, and I'm going to vote on that basis, and there's nothing in democracy or separation of church and state to prevent you from doing that. But the fact of the matter is, if in California there's Proposition 8, or if you're discussing gay marriage at the court, uh, right. That won't work. You can't just say it says so in the book of Leviticus. You actually now right. need, I would call it, Christian bilingualism. That's right. Uh, you need to know the biblical view, but you need, need to be able to articulate it in, in a, a legal manner setting. or in a philosophical manner, and you able, you're able to persuade people who don't share your biblical assumptions. That's right. And that's a special challenge facing us now right. that wasn't around in 1865. Yes, and then I would also encourage, Dinesh, uh, I would encourage... Christians not to, uh, yes, to do what you're saying, appeal to secular reasons, consequences, results, and things like that. But there are po appropriate points where I think it is still right for Christians to say, well, this is what the Bible teaches about marriage, about uh, stealing, about contracts, about private property. And I believe it because the Bible says this. Do you think this is uh, a persuasive reason or not? And allow the word of God, which has power, to see mm -hmm. if it, to, and let's see if it will persuade people. The truth. I, I remember speaking to um, uh, a country in, a, in another country uh, 
where the population was maybe 1% evangelical Christian. And I was talking about biblical principles for economic growth and business. And I said, look, um, some of you, many, many of you may not accept the Bible as the word of God, as I do, but I'm just asking you to listen to it and consider it as a book of ancient wisdom and see if it doesn't seem right to you. Because mm -hmm. I think what happens is the moral standards of the Bible, it's the only teaching we have from the God of the universe right. where he tells us how he wants us to live. It's, and it's it's, it, it finds an echo in the yes. heart of every person. And so though people say, I don't want to hear the Bible, I don't want to hear the Bible, if there's an appropriate time where people will listen for a couple of minutes, as I did with my congressman when we lived back in Illinois at one point, I said, could I talk to you about this passage in the Bible having to do with implications for abortion? Mm -hmm. He listened. He gave me 45 minutes to talk to him. I couldn't believe it. Uh, in his office, alone, with just an aide. That's the power of the Word it of God. The power of the, the Word Holy of God. Spirit so I don't want to give up on that. Amen. Absolutely. Well, I think what I try Amen. to do in, in Christian apologetics and debates with atheists and so on, I'll, talk, I'll start by talking about what we know about the world now. So, for example, one of the great discoveries of recent science, the universe had a beginning. Mm -hmm. And not only the universe had a beginning, but space and time had a beginning. Oh, what Very amazing, weird. What right? an amazing discovery. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> right. So that, that somewhere. once upon a time, Hello. there was no time. <laughs> right. And a very counterintuitive discovery by science. And I say, wait a minute, you know what? A very long time ago, a bunch of Jews came up with the same idea. Uh, and by the way, this is not all ancient religions, because in mm -hmm. other religions, True. God or gods made the world out right. of some pre-existing stuff. Right. But only here, in this one book, in the first chapter, yeah. God makes the universe out right. of nothing. Nothing. Um, and uh, so... Um, it's a way of saying, you know what? You scientists have been slowly climbing up the mountain of oh, knowledge, good, yeah. and you finally come across the last turn, and oh no, I sitting up it. there are these ancient Jewish theologians kind of <laughs> wisely <laughs> nodding their heads to each other. Well, that gets people intrigued, and they're like, oh wow. Well, you know what? Now let me go look and see what else yes. it says in there. So it, it becomes a way of opening uh, yes. uh, the... Um, uh, establishing in almost secular terms yes. that the Bible does speak to our very modern situation yes. uh, and it gets otherwise uh, jaded people to uh, want to take another look. So we end this right now. The vote's coming up and we vote our biblical worldview, which presupposes the Christian knows their Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not about race. It's not about party. Though the platforms have never been more diverse from one another as they are today. It's not about the religion of the candidates. It's not about the religion of the candidates. It's which one stands for righteousness as per Bible. Yep. Biblical worldview. Exactly. That's, that's what the Christian is to be doing. Yep. And so I want to thank both of you for being here. Dinesh D'Souza, congratulations on not only just your career and uh, being president at King's College in New York and all that you're doing, but this amazing success of the documentary. And um, we look forward to talking to you in the future. And Dr. Wayne Grudem, um, just genius. What do, what do well, I say? I don't know An excellent author. I highly recommend both the books that you guys uh, put out. Uh, whatever you guys write is worth all the reading. And um, I'm just glad, very glad, to have you on our side in, in this battle uh, for faith and uh, really for righteousness. So thank you so much, thank Dinesh. You. Thank you, Jack. Wayne, God bless Enjoy you. to be here. Thank you. Well, we've heard some tremendous challenges about why we should be involved. First of all, as citizens, for one thing, and the Christian, definitely. We've got some tremendous challenges that are coming up before us. And yet, it's amazing, right here in America, we don't have bloody violent revolutions every two or four years. We have a revolution in the voting box, and that is a privilege and a blessing that God has provided. And so with all that's coming up, I wanna encourage you to get involved, to get your Christianity and your biblical worldview out on the street and beyond the walls of your church. And listen, most importantly above all things, that you would know Jesus Christ. He's the Lord and Savior. He's the one that forgives us of our sins who died on the cross and rose again from the grave. And so I want to encourage you to make that commitment to Jesus. And if you do make that commitment, or if you'd like to find out more, you'll receive information at the end of this program. But listen, it's our hope that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.